Welcome to our fifth message in this series on the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 17 contains an interesting passage that appears quite unexpectedly, especially if you're familiar with the sequence of events in Old Testament Israel's history. Listen as I first read the passage. After that, we'll consider why this passage is unexpected here in Deuteronomy. The passage is found in chapter 17, verses 14 to 20. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. But he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, You shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Allow me to explain why this discussion of a king in Israel is unexpected by giving you a bit of Old Testament chronology. Joseph, his brothers, and his father Jacob settled in Egypt in 1876 BC. 430 years later, in 1446 BC, they departed in the Exodus. They first went to Mount Sinai, where they stayed about a year and a half. Then God led them to Kadesh Barnea. It was there that the Israelites rebelled against God, refusing to begin the conquest. As a result, God led the Israelites through the wilderness for 38 years until every person who had been above the age of 20 at Kadesh Barnea had died. At that point, God began to lead the new generation in battle against the Amorites on the east side of the Dead Sea. They defeated the king of Arad and the two kings, Sihon and Og. They then camped on the east side of the Jordan River, opposite Jericho. It was there, in the year 1406 BC, that Moses presented the three discourses that are recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. After Moses died, Joshua led the Israelites in the conquest of Canaan, and then he died. What followed was the period recorded in the book of Judges, a period that lasted about 350 years. During those difficult centuries, the Israelites were attacked and oppressed repeatedly by the surrounding nations. It was not until 1051 BC that the Israelites had their first king, King Saul. One reason why God's instructions concerning kings in Deuteronomy is surprising is that he gave those instructions three and a half centuries before he gave them a king. There's also another reason why God's instructions concerning kings in Deuteronomy are surprising. It is not until the year 1051 BC that the Israelites request a king. In verse 5 of 1 Samuel chapter 7, they deliver this demand to Samuel. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Samuel relays their request to God. Listen to God's response in chapter 8, verse 7. Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. God is highly displeased at the people's request for a king. Biblical skeptics sometimes argue that we have a contradiction here. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, God predicts with approval that Israel will have kings, and yet he's greatly displeased when they request a king. 
The skeptics resolve what they see as a contradiction by arguing that the book of Deuteronomy is not an authentic writing of Moses from 1406 BC, but instead a forgery from the time of King Josiah. There is absolutely no reason to come to such a conclusion if we take a bit of time to look more closely at the evidence. First of all, predictive prophecy is common in Scripture. It is not at all surprising that God predicted well in advance that Israel would one day have kings. Secondly, there is no contradiction between God's instructions in Deuteronomy 17 and his disapproval of Israel's demand for a king in 1 Samuel. Listen again to the demand of the Israelites, which is stated even more clearly in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 19 and 20. No, but we will have a king over us that we may also be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. God's disapproval of their request for a king was not because he disapproved of kings. God's objection had to do with the kind of king that the Israelites wanted. They wanted a king like the kings of the nations. In other words, they believed that the cause of the many calamities and military defeats that they experienced in the days of the judges was insufficient military power. They were badly mistaken. The calamities that they suffered during the days of the judges were penalties that God had imposed upon them for their sins of idolatry. As we work our way through the book of Deuteronomy in the coming messages of this series, we will examine those penalties and the sins that God warned would bring them on. For now, let's turn our attention to God's instructions for the future kings of Israel in Deuteronomy 17. God gives one requirement three prohibitions, and one positive command. Let's look at each one of these. The requirement appears in verse 15. The king must be a native Israelite. No foreigner may ever be king in Israel. The first prohibition appears in verse 16. He shall not multiply horses for himself. Keep in mind that in the ancient Near East, Horses were the key to military power. A king with many horses and many chariots would be hard to defeat in battle. The second prohibition appears in the beginning of verse 17. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. It was common in the ancient Near East for kings to have many wives. But God warns that having many wives could lead Israel's king into idolatry. The reason for this is obvious if you stop to think about it. Kings didn't typically seek multiple wives from their own people. Kings gained wives when neighboring kingdoms sought to create alliances through marriage. The Israelites were surrounded by pagan nations that worshipped false gods. Any wife given as a gift from a foreign nation would be a pagan herself. If you know the story of King Solomon, you know how dangerous foreign wives could be. Solomon ignored this prohibition, and the results were disastrous. The third prohibition appears in the latter part of verse 17. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. To put it another way, kings in Israel should not seek to accumulate great amounts of wealth. This, too, is a warning that Solomon failed to obey. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you can hear the bitter lesson that Solomon learned from the great wealth that he gathered. Think now of the three things against which God warned Israel's future kings. Money, women, and power. The world has changed, but men have not. These three things are still stumbling blocks to men today. Finally, we come to God's one positive command for kings. Listen again to verses 18 through 20. Also it shall be, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes 
that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Did you catch what God was commanding each king of Israel to do? To make his own copy in his own handwriting of the law of Israel. Scholars differ regarding whether God was speaking only of the book of Leviticus or of the entire Pentateuch. Either way, this was quite an assignment. How long do you think it would take you to copy by hand the whole book of Leviticus, let alone the entire Pentateuch? Now that would be a very effective way to learn the law of God. There are many lessons that we can learn from God's instructions to Israel's future kings here in Deuteronomy 17. One has to do with human rulers. Most countries in the world require that their leaders be native-born. That idea comes right out of our passage. The hunger for horses, wives, and golds, or to put it more generally, the pursuit of power, sex, and money, is the cause of much trouble and anguish in our world today. That fact alone is worthy of much reflection. But I want to focus on God's one positive command here. His command that the kings of Israel should copy and carry the book of the law with them at all times. Why did God give this command to the future kings of Israel? He gave it so that, as God says in verse 20, his heart may not be lifted up above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left. I am no king, and I doubt that you are either. But isn't this command from God advice that we too can benefit from? Have you ever considered doing something like what God commanded the kings of Israel to do? One of the best ways to learn scripture is to write it down by hand. There's something special about actually writing something down with a pen or a pencil on paper that helps you to remember it. Staring at the verses printed in your Bible or even typing them into a computer just doesn't have the same effect. Let me challenge you to try this out. Pick a portion of scripture, perhaps a psalm that is special to you, or a story from one of the Gospels, or a paragraph or two from one of the New Testament epistles. Get yourself some paper and a pencil and copy it by hand from your Bible, exactly, word for word. Then carry it with you in your wallet or your purse. Take it out and read it out loud from time to time. You will be surprised how quickly that scripture will burn itself into your memory. The day may come when that one portion of God's word will provide you with needed comfort or warning or strength at just the right moment. <laughs>